Catherine Gale is a business leader, author, and speaker. She's not only that, uh, she was the CEO of Gale Foods, which is a $250 million Wisconsin food manufacturing company that she helmed until she sold that business uh, four or five years ago in order to concentrate on her passion, uh, which was to take a deep look uh, at political dysfunction in the United States, the high levels of dissatisfaction, and the poor results that seem to attend uh, to our political system, uh, rather, and, and try and, and transform it, reform it, so that the political system and uh, the public interest are aligned. Uh, and his, uh, her collaborator, uh, Michael Porter of Harvard Business School, uh, you certainly know his name. I've seen him speak before. I can tell you between the two of them, you are in for a real treat. Their interesting approach to thinking about politics is to think about it in a fresh way, namely to think about politics uh, not as some sort of sterile off to the side enterprise, but as a competitive industry and to apply in some cases some of the things that they have both learned in their careers uh, to reforming our political system. Mr. Porter is uh, an economist. He's a researcher, an author, advisor, speaker, and teacher. He spent a lifetime at Harvard Business School bringing economic theory and strategy concepts to bear on many of the most challenging problems facing corporations. He's the author of 19 books, over 130 articles, and is the most cited scholar today in economics and business. Catherine and Michael will discuss their brown groundbreaking research and analysis on and prescription for reforming our political system. Please welcome Catherine Gale and Michael Porter. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Michael, wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, I am so happy to be here. I'm from Chicago. I'm about to go back <laughs> to 14 inches, supposedly. Thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you to everybody for being here. We're going to start with a couple of questions, and I actually need some audience participation. So please raise your hands if you drink wine or beer. All right, it's a very fun crowd. Keep your hands up if you are, in general, quite satisfied with the choices that you have in the marketplace of wine and beer. Yeah, me too. And now, keep your hands up if you vote. And do keep your hands up if you are, in general, quite satisfied with the choices that you have in the marketplace of politics. And this is why we're here. It really begs the question, why in America do we have over 6,000 breweries and 3,000 wineries, and yet when it comes to our politics, we get to choose between Soviet Refrigerator A and Soviet Refrigerator B? Oh, it's very funny in the Midwest. <laughs> we drink more or we're friendlier, I'm not sure. So, the answer to this question is that unlike the beer and wine industries. In the politics industry, we don't have healthy competition. We don't have innovation, results, and accountability. The best of what I sometimes call free market politics. And today, we're gonna talk about how we can get from here to there. So let's start with the one thing about which virtually everybody does agree today, and that is Washington is broken. We say it all the time, as it turns out, it represents a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem. In fact, Washington is working exactly how it's designed to work. And that design has created a huge problem for the country, which I'll illustrate with a Venn diagram. So currently, there is virtually no intersection, no connection between our elected officials acting in the public interest and the likelihood that they will be able to get reelected. So in other words, if America's elected representatives do their jobs the way we want and need them to, they're likely to lose those jobs. And that's a crazy design. We'd never do that in our businesses. But fortunately, it's also an optional design. We can change it, and again, that's what today is about. So in 2016, I asked Michael to join me on this new approach to uh, fixing our politics, which is, as Tyler mentioned, using the tools of competition and industry thinking to understand politics. 
Turns out that using these tools to look at politics sheds new light on the problems because politics has become a major industry that functions very much like the for-profit industries for which Michael had originally developed these tools. Our political problems are not due to a single cause. They're due to a failure of the nature of the political competition that has been created. The purpose of our work is simple. We wanted to figure out precisely what it would take to change the system powerfully enough to change the results that the system regularly delivers. And it turns out the most important, the most powerful changes and solutions center around the very foundation of our democracy, how we vote. The political innovations that we'll recommend today will break partisan gridlock and deliver results and accountability for, this, for the country. Please know that when we talk today, it's about politics, but it's not political. So Michael's a lifelong Republican, I used to be a Democrat, now I'm a politically homeless, centrist independent. And the problem is not the Democrats or the Republicans or even the existence of parties per se. The problem is not individual politicians, the problem is the system. So first, Michael's going to review what's at stake, and then I'll be back to talk about what's gone wrong, who's to blame, and most importantly, how to fix it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Catherine, and uh, thank you all for being here. I, uh, this is a very festive meeting that we walked into with music. And now we're talking about something not so festive. Uh, so I hope all of you can preserve the, uh, that positive energy that I felt earlier. And let's, let's turn it on to this, this topic. Now, um, you know, how did I get involved in this? Uh, politics is the last thing I ever thought I would work on. I'm, I, I work on competitiveness and strategy and economic development and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, yes, I was a Republican in Massachusetts, which we're proud of in Massachusetts, being a Republican. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I didn't work at all on this. I had no idea why we had such a mess on our hands. And, um, but it really got serious for me when we at Harvard Business School did something, started something we called the U.S. Competitiveness Project. And this was a commitment by the entire institution to really dig in what was going on in our economy. Uh, yes, we had the Great Recession, but what we've discovered very quickly was the, the, the trends that led to the Great Recession had started way earlier than the actual start of the recession. There were things building. There, were, there, was, there was a diminishing performance already in place. And, um, and, and we were very interested in trying to understand what we need to do to kind of fix uh, these problems. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, this slide is kind of a single slide summary of some of the findings in that report, the US Competitiveness Report of the Harvard Business School, which, which you can get uh, copies of if you're interested. Um, what we did was we asked all, uh, all of our alumni to tell us what they thought was going on in the economy. What, what are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What's getting better? What's getting worse? And uh, this is kind of the high-level uh, summary of that. And you can see that, that the US, fortunately, has strengths. That we have some very compelling strengths. Entrepreneurship, uh, excellent management, great universities, and so on, you see there. Uh, but what we discovered was that there's a growing number of rather significant weaknesses that have emerged uh, over time. Uh, yeah, the U.S., uh, you know, we once had the, a really great public education system. Now we don't. Our, our K-12 through system is getting worse. Still getting worse. It's been decades of getting worse. Uh, we have lousy infrastructure. Uh, our worker skills are no longer the best in the world. Our regulatory system is very complex and very expensive and very costly and very distortive in many ways. Uh, our legal system is very high cost. There's got to be a better way. Uh, the healthcare system is extraordinarily high cost. 
an area where I also work uh, extensively, and more. Uh, the problems we have with our economy, which were really below the surface, uh, uh, are what has led to the rising inequality we have in our country. This has been another long-term trend, rising inequality. It's been going on for a long, long time. It's also meant that many Americans in, in recent decades haven't earned really a living wage in the full sense of the term living. Uh, and we also uh, uh, found that uh, the participation of Americans in the workforce was actually lower now than it's been for many decades. Yes, we have a lot of employed people, but we have a lot of people that really don't have the employment they want or don't have employment at all. And we found that these weaknesses were getting worse. And if you look at this chart uh, and you look at the strengths that are improving, who's responsible for those topics? Private sector. That's all in the private sector. Now, I'm not saying the private sector is perfect, but in terms of good management and entrepreneurship and great universities and innovation, private sector is doing a good job. Where's all the problems? K through 12, healthcare, legal framework, logistics, macro policy, skill labor, tax code, all in government. Everything on the weaknesses column turned out to be uh, a responsibility of government. And the government just hadn't been fulfilling that responsibility for quite some time now. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Of course, at HBS, we, we thought, oh, we, we can fix it. Uh, we came up with what we call the eight-point plan, and we picked the eight policy changes that were most critical to fix the tra trajectory of the economy in some of the areas I just talked about. Um, we trooped down to Washington repeatedly and talked to many members, I would say hundreds of members of Congress, uh, about our diagnosis of what's going on here in America, and then our recommendations of you know, what needs to be fixed, our eight-point plan. I, I can tell you the following about all those visits. First of all, we were, very, we were made to feel very welcome. Uh, number two, everybody was very supportive of what we said. Oh, we agree with the diagnosis. You're right. We agree with what we need to improve. But then my life changed. Because as we were walking out the door, over and over again, I was here, you know, it's going to be very hard to do those things we need to do. In fact, I'm not sure we can. So all of a sudden, I, something hit me that had hit Catherine much earlier. And that is, uh, we've got to deal with our political system. We just can't think that good economic policy is going to get us where we need to go. You can see where our alumni voted the political system should be on this chart. It's our worst weakness and getting worse the fastest. And that's really why we're all here today. And why this is, there's nothing more important in America right now than really dealing with this issue. Now, we also discovered um, some time ago that, that economics is only half of the problem in, in our country. Uh, we also have a, a social agenda, a quality of life agenda, an environmental agenda. We have a whole variety of things that matter to what life in America is like and what kind of society we are and how we work with each other and engage with each other. Uh, we'd never been able to really benchmark that topic, but I led a team that created something called the Social Progress Index. I won't go through the details, but we looked at many, many dimensions of social, economic, environmental performance, quality of life performance, not economic, uh, and we then benchmarked those against virtually every country in the world. We can also compare every state in America. What did we find there? Well, at the same time as our economy was limping along, and in, in the longest recession in probably history, it was so slow to get sorted out. Uh, what we found was the U.S. is underperforming there in the social agenda as well. Just look at some of these numbers. We compare ourselves in this chart to the other OECD or advanced countries that are kind of wealthy countries like we are. 
um, you know, what, what, is this, what is this telling us? We are in America, um, we are 32nd in the world in access to quality education. Does that sound like something that should be? We're 32nd in the world. We are um, 34th in the world in maternal mortality. We are 25th in the world in the country that was going to be the land of equality and the free for discrimination and violence against minorities. You, you can read the whole list. But the basic finding here is this isn't pretty either. We were kind of punting on the economic changes we need to make and didn't do them. But on the social agenda, we're not get, getting much done either. And there's many other areas, gun violence, you can just go on and on and on about the things that would make our society better, our quality of life better, uh, that we're not doing. We just can't get anything done. And these social things have a big part in the inequality as well. So when, when a kind of slippery economy uh, meets social, lack of social progress, boy, you end up with a lot of inequality, a lot of dissension, a lot of people not, not doing well. So the question is, what's causing all this? I originally thought that it was a policy problem, that the guys in Washington or women in Washington just weren't smart enough to set the right policies. So we did it for them. And, went with great enthusiasm to, to Washington to give them the, the answer. And it turns out it was a dumb answer. It wasn't going to work. Because what we discovered was, what Catherine's already told you, the problem in America is not the parties, it's not the Republicans, it's we have a political system problem. The system is designed in a, today to not succeed, to not serve our needs. Um, to understand what's going on, we're going to have to look at it in a fresh way. It's not just who gets elected. That turns out not to be that big a deal. Um, uh, but, but it turns out if we have to understand how this system works and what incentives that it's creating that is leading to the lack of performance in terms of good results, the gridlock, the division, the bitter partisanship, what's causing all that? And to do that, uh, we, uh, we had to dig deeper. So let me uh, turn it back over to Catherine and uh, get us started in, in that journey. Thank you. Great. Okay, so I want to return to this idea that Washington is broken. As I said, that's not actually the case. Washington's doing what it's designed to do. It's designed by and for the benefit of what we call the political industrial complex. Not for voters, not for citizens, not for the public interest. So let's take a peek under the proverbial hood and then what we find is that the politics industry actually works very differently from what most of us have assumed, including me, until I got into this work. So I want to take you back to 2009 when Joe Biden became vice president. His Senate seat was then open in Delaware, and everybody in Delaware supposedly knew who was going to be the next senator from the state of Delaware. It was the most popular politician in the state, their multiple-term congressman and governor, Mike Castle. But Mike Castle ran in his Republican primary, and he lost. Now, this was shocking news, but not theoretically insurmountable, because if you think about it, he could put himself in the general election as an independent, and he would have won because he was by far the most well-liked politician. But none of us have ever heard of a Senator Mike Castle. And that's because there was a slight problem for him. Delaware has a law, and it's called the sore loser law. And what this says is if you run and lose in your party primary, Democrat or Republican, you are not allowed to have your name on the ballot in the general election in November. The question is, how many states? How many states have essentially an undemocratic rule like this that allows private political parties to control access to the general election ballot? 
And the answer is 44. And we're sitting in one today. Now, there are a few other things we have to understand about party primaries. So primaries are the reason why so many show up at the uh, general election and think, gosh, I really don't like these choices that I have. Because over 80% of elections are actually decided in the primary. And the small number of voters who regularly turn out for the primaries tend to be more ideologically extreme than the general electorate, which forces candidates to go further to the right and the left than citizens as a whole really want. But most importantly, the, party, the influence of the party primary extends to actual legislating, to actually doing our business in Washington, D.C. So it, it's not just what you have to say to get elected, uh, imagine for a moment that you are a politician, actually, and headed, hopefully, to Washington, D.C. It's not just what you have to say to get elected. It's that once you're in office and you have an opportunity to vote yes on a bipartisan compromise piece of landmark legislation, perhaps to solve one of those enormous problems that Michael referred to, it makes sense to ask yourself these questions. Is this the right policy? Is this a good idea? Is this what the majority of my constituents want? But actually, you don't ask yourself any of those questions. The question you ask is, will I make it back through my next party primary if I vote for this? And if the answer to that question is no, and on the important questions, it virtually always is, then the rational incentive to get reelected dictates that you vote no. And it makes the important questions fundamentally irrelevant. Now, occasionally, duty, principle could win the day, and you decide to vote yes anyway. Well, what happens next? You'll be threatened with a primary. In the last 15 years, primary has morphed from being just a noun, the primary, to being a verb, to primary, as in, we're going to primary you. And what that means is we're going to run someone further to your left if you're a Democrat, further to your right if you're a Republican. It never means we're going to run a more problem-solving, consensus-oriented politician to your middle. This system of party primaries effectively pushes our politicians right and left and makes it very difficult to govern. Now, I want to consider a second example of our partisan system, and this one isn't from elections, it's from actually governing. So our major parties, what we call in this competition thinking the duopoly, also have perverted, in a sense, the legislative process for partisan gain. I'm going to give you an example. There's a rule called the Hastert Rule. Some of you may have heard of it. And it's a particularly egregious example of party control taking precedence over the legislature's ability to solve problems. So the Hastert rule has become a well-accepted practice of the speakers of the House, all of them, Democrats, Republicans. And what it says is that the speaker will not allow a floor vote on a piece of legislation unless it is supported by a majority of the majority, which is to say a majority of the speaker's party. So unless the speaker uh, sort of ignores this rule, which they do from time to time, but very rarely. Legislation supported by a majority of the country and even by a majority of the House, which is to say virtually all of the party, you know, sort of out of control and, and some members of the speaker's party, even legislation like that has no chance of passing because there will never even be a vote. The Hastert rule has real-life consequences, and I'm going to take you back to one. In 2013, we had one of our government shutdowns, and that shutdown could have been entirely averted, entirely, or ended at any time if then-Speaker John Boehner had allowed a floor vote on legislation that was already passed by the Senate and would have been signed by President Obama. And it was supported by a majority of the House the whole time, which was virtually all of the Democrats plus a minority of Republicans. 
And in fact, the shutdown ended only when Speaker Boehner broke the Hastert rule and broke with his party in order to allow the vote. So effectively, this made up rule, again, used by Democrats and Republicans, cements majority party control in a legislature that is supposed to represent all citizens. And in this particular case, the Hastert rule cost the country $24 billion in a 16-day shutdown that 90% of the country didn't want from the start. So if you think about it in the context of all the organizations you've been involved in in your life, if you were committed to solving your biggest problems, I suspect that one thing you wouldn't do is bring everybody together in a room like this and then say, oh, quickly, just a moment. Before we get started, let's count off by twos and divide into warring teams, and then we'll get right to work. But effectively, that is the way the legislative process now works. My daughter, uh, my 14-year-old daughter, describes the situation best with a joke. If con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? She's funny. Okay, and she's listened to this speech way too many times, so she thinks I need some levity. Okay, in, in the duopoly, the players advance their own interests ahead of the public interest. And what's unique about the politics industry as compared to virtually every other industry is that there's no independent regulation. The actors in the industry are the ones that themselves make the rules of the game. So many of us mistakenly believe that the rules of our political system are set in the Constitution. But in fact, most of the rules that govern the day-to-day -day incentives in politics are set by and for the political industrial complex and for their benefit. So for example, you've all heard of the pocket constitution. And there are in here six tiny paragraphs governing how the House and Senate should work. And, oh, thank you, Alex. This is the House Rules Book. This is 1,500 pages of legislative machinery. And even in our research, we haven't read it. But I know, and you know, what's not in here is best practices of problem solving. It's absolutely a set of rules made up to sort of divide the spoils of power. And I'm going to set it over here right on top of the Senate Rules Book. And we can just look at that and think about what it would mean to try to run or our organizations with that kind of bureaucracy. As is always the case in life, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played and affect the outcome of that game. And the net result of the rules of the game in politics is unhealthy competition. There's unhealthy competition in elections, and again, there's unhealthy competition in legislating. The net result of unhealthy competition in any industry is that customers are not well served. So thus, the actors in the political industry are actually thriving. Go to DC, you can see it. And yet the American public has simply never been more dissatisfied. You'll see here that just uh, two years ago, a new Gallup poll came out, and 57% of Americans think a third major party is needed. And the percentage of Americans self-identifying as independent is at an all-time high. It's 46%, which is far greater than the 27% who identify as Democrat or the 26 that identify as Republican. In any other industry this large, with this much customer dissatisfaction, some entrepreneur would see it as a phenomenal business opportunity and create a new competitor responding to what customers want. And yet that doesn't happen in politics because the duopoly works very well together in one particular way. And that is to rig the rules of the game to protect themselves jointly from new competition. In competition thinking, we say 
they erect huge barriers to entry that keep out new competitors. Said another way, politics isn't broken, it's fixed. This looks like a promising antitrust case. But you won't at this point be surprised to know that ever so conveniently, antitrust regulation doesn't apply to the politics industry. And troublingly, there's no accountability for any of this, and there's no accountability because the customer only has two choices. So the only thing that either party has to do to win is to convince the average voter to choose them as either the lesser of two evils or because at least that party says, therefore, what that voter, voter believes. But what neither party has to do in this duopoly is to deliver results. Because no matter how disappointed you may be, you're still going to likely prefer what your side says therefore than what the one other choice says therefore. And the question is, how did it come to this? And for that, I turn it back to Michael. Thank you. Well, this gets more and more cheerful <laughs> as we go along. So now let's just burrow down a little bit more deeply into the nature of the competition that's been created here. And uh, of course, uh, some of you are going to laugh when you see this, but there's a diagram that some of you may have been forced to learn in business school. It's called the five forces analysis of an industry. Uh, and as Catherine has said, this politics is an industry. It's not a public institution. It's not people with that public service mindset. It's an industry. And they're competing, and there's massive amounts of money involved here uh, that people are, are uh, actually thriving in attracting. So what is the politics industry uh, look like um, well, first of all, it's really intricate, and uh, we spent years really trying to understand all the complex rules and subtleties of, of how this all works. But uh, when you look at any industry, uh, you always want to start in the middle there, which we call rivalry. So the heart of competition is the rivals, the people, the Coke or the Pepsi, you know, whoever's competing head to head. Here, it's the Republicans and the Democrats. Those are the rivals. Um, they are dominant. There is no other game. So that's why Catherine uses the phrase, and we use the phrase, duopoly. This is a duopoly. There's only two, and they are very dominant. And it's not just their market share, it's a lot of other things that we'll cover very, very briefly. What are they competing on? They're competing on two things. One, they're competing to win elections, which takes place now through the partisan primary system. Uh, and they're competing to govern, to get their way in governing, to pass the legislation they want, not the legislation necessarily that they agree with the other party we should want. Okay, uh, so they're competing very fiercely. They're they're very uh, there's a lot of edge in those parties. Uh, they they really compete. Um, and uh, what we see whenever we have a duopoly. We have two dominant competitors. Think there are other industries. You know, there was the, in the old days there was Coke versus Pepsi. In the old days there was Airbus versus Boeing. Boeing is sort of a little bit troubled right now, uh, but it'll get back to, to being the part of the duopoly there too. Uh, whenever we look at a duopoly, we see some very important points that we have to understand. Number one is when you have two dominant competitors. They don't want to compete head to head. They don't want to. Because if you're facing a gargantuan large competitor and you go head to head, that's a pretty destructive competition. It's hard to win. It's hard to prevail. Uh, uh, you're less, if, if you're doing the same thing as your rival, and, uh, you're less accountable. Uh, you're, uh, you're less accountable than, than you, you'd like to be. So, um, uh, so the first thing we have to understand is the parties, um, uh, they uh, don't want to go head to head. They don't compete uh, for the average voter. Why? Because if they competed for the average voter, they'd be going head to head. And they'd be making promises to the same people, 
Uh, and then they could you know, have little differences in whether they met them or the other guy met them. At least they would have some accountability to meet the promises. Right now, there is no accountability uh, in the duopoly. Uh, the parties don't compete for the middle. They're not going for the median voter. If they were going for that median voter, again, it'd be hard to win. If the median voters didn't like them, they'd get kicked out. But they don't, do, they don't compete that way. What they've done instead is a classic business strategy ploy. They have divided the voters. They have segmented the voters into two big segments. There's the segments that the Republicans have fo focused on, and then there's the segments that the Democrats have focused on. And those core customers who the parties are trying to serve, they're not trying to serve the average voter, they're not trying to serve the middle, who they're trying to serve are these two customer groups, uh, which consist of partisan primary voters. Why? Catherine's told you why. Really important. Uh, number two, they're, um, uh, they're competing for uh, special interests that are aligned with that party's ideology. So there are certain special interest areas that are more uh, uh, oriented to the left or to the progressive side. There's other special interests that are more oriented towards the conservative or the, or the Republican side. And essentially what the parties have said is, well, let's divide up the customers and the ones that vote in all our, prim our partisan primaries, because they're more, again, likable to what we do, and all the special interests that really care about our philosophy will compete with that group, and the other side will compete with the other group. That's the way it works. And that is enormously destructive for our society. And uh, we'll get more into all the, the reasons why, but also what to do. The good news is there is a way we can deal with this. We can fix this. So uh, we'll get there, hopefully as soon as possible, so you won't be too depressed. Um, so in addition to the duopoly and these customer groups, you can see on the right-hand side, there's, this, there's citizens, donors, uh, primary voters and special interest, and, and the focus of each party is their primary voters and the special interest on their side. Citizens, eh, not interesting. Donors, if they're really big, they also tend to be one of those other categories. They might be a special interest interested in this, which fits with the Democratic side or the Republican side. Okay, so uh, there's customers. And what I just told you is these, these, these competitors don't see each customer as equal. We're not all equal. They see a certain set of customers, a set of cer segment of customers, as the ones that will give them the most value in terms of votes and money. And that's what they're competing on. Okay? Um, so uh, customers are very interesting in this industry. Uh, and I didn't say the customer is the average voter. The customer is the public interest. The customer is the citizens. No, no, no. That's not who they're serving. It's not who they're serving. And you start watching and listening, and, and it'll be, become very clear to all of you if it already isn't. Uh, in every industry, we have customers. We also have suppliers. You see here who the suppliers are to this industry. It's a big, complicated industry. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of people to run elections these days. There's a lot of technology, a lot of voter data, uh, a lot of staff and expertise to run these campaigns. Um, and essentially what's happened is both parties need the suppliers, the same suppliers. But the suppliers now have been divided into two groups. There's the suppliers to Republicans, and then there's the suppliers to Democrats. If you're a Republican campaign manager and you ever work for a Democratic campaign, your career is over. You gotta choose. You're in one camp or the other. And that's true for every single one of these groups. And sadly, it even includes think tanks. Think tanks used to be neutral. Now they're not. You're either a more left side or a right side think tank. 
So what you see here is not only are you targeting very different customers, but your suppliers are in two camps, and they're reinforcing the bitter partisanship between their way and your way. That's how this game is played every day in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, another critical part of any uh, industry is channels. How do you reach the consumer? Uh, there's a list there you can see. Part of it is just direct motor contact. You have an event, people come. Not so much of that these days, but there's a lot of paid advertising, a lot of media, independent media, so-called. There's a lot of uh, social media now. Uh, and what's happened with the channels is pretty much the same thing as happened with the suppliers. They've been divided. The parties control their channels, whether they're independent media like CNBC versus MSNBC, or whether they're their their, their field force that does the ground game, uh, uh, their whole advertising uh, infrastructure to, to pr produce the advertising. So not only do we have the suppliers facing off on, on two opposite sides, but we also have the channels that used to be a sort of independent neutral force have been co-opted by the parties. And then the last key thing about this industry, uh, well, there's two things, but one is that, that, as Catherine said, the barriers to entry are incredibly high here. Uh, how do you know the barriers to entry are high to getting into the politics industry? Well, the answer is that we haven't had a new party succeed since 1854. That was the last really new successful party. We've had some parties try, but they don't really get anywhere. Even Teddy Roosevelt's party didn't really get very far. Uh, Ross Perot didn't really get very far. So there's something about the barriers to entry here, and the b barriers are they've controlled the suppliers. So if you're somebody outside of the game, you can't get a campaign manager. They control the channels. Um, they have enormous economies of scale because they're running hundreds of elections all the time. You come in as a new party, no way you're going to be able to match their expertise and their, and, and their uh, scale effects, and more and more. That's an example of what Catherine said. When you're in a duopoly, another thing you learn is you want to cooperate to make the industry more attractive to you. That's what they've done. And the money's just pouring in. It's pouring in. Uh, massive amounts of money are pouring in, uh, both to the parties themselves, but also to the whole lobbying infrastructure. Six, seven billion dollars every single year. It's a big, prosperous industry, even though it's not working for us. It's supposed to work for us. It's not. It's working for them. Um, substitutes are alternative ways of competing besides a new party. Here it would be independence. But for the same reasons I've discussed, independents are getting nowhere. They never get elected. Why? Because, again, the barriers to entry and some of these rules that Catherine has talked about and will talk about make it almost impossible for an independent to win. Even though 46% of people say, I, I, I stand for being an independent, no independent ever get elected. That seems weird. It's not, actually, if you understand the rules. So what are the implications of this? Well, I, I remember when we first came, wrote this chart. And it was probably one of the most depressing days of my life. What are the implications of this industry that we've just discussed and this competition that we've just discussed? Political competition is not about solving our problems. Political competition is all about ideology. I'm super conservative. I'm very progressive. And I care not about solving the problem of X, Y, or Z. What I care about is preserving that ideology, preserving that view of the world, which is, I believe in. But what we find is, although you know, there's some ideological things that are, you, know, you understand why people think that way? Uh, ideology never determines good public policy because it's too complicated. You don't want free trade or protectionism. That's not your choices. That's the ideological view. 
What you want is, is a blend, which takes advantage of the fact that trade has some good benefits, but you got to make sure that trade is fair. So a good trade policy is going to deal with the complexities of stitching those things together. That takes cooperation. It takes collegiality. Uh, it takes problem solving, uh, which we have in America today none, none, and none. No wonder we're not passing any legislation. No wonder we're not solving any of the big problems. The one example that we've passed in recent, uh, during recent administration is the tax bill, which uh, I'm sure, given the business group in this audience, it probably you were happy they did it. Uh, and we definitely needed a corporate tax uh, reform because we had this weird system where you had to pay taxes overseas and then you had to pay US taxes in the US and then you couldn't take the overseas profit and bring it back. It was a big mess. We needed to fix it and we did fix that, but it was also a very partisan bill. It was the, the, the reduction in the corporate tax rate was much higher than it needed to be. And that's why we're, you know, they're talking now about our deficit being how much? You've been reading the paper lately? One trillion dollars. And it's because we made such a huge hit in the, in the rate, uh, and we didn't raise anything else, and we didn't uh, really restructure in any way the system. Uh, the bill, it was a really a, a lost opportunity, it's bad policy. This is getting depressing even to me. We okay. might need to move to solutions. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think what we're going to do now is move to solutions. And you can see all the other things on this list. And clearly, it's not going to happen by itself. So let's talk about solutions. Thanks, Kathy. Oh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> OK. Oh, my. Here you go. Oh, I know I'm going to fall one of these days. And that was almost it. OK. So we are now at the part for solutions. Um, I want to summarize the theory of change in any game, boards games, sports games, serious games like politics. As we said, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played and affect that outcome. So, to transform our politics system, we have to re-engineer the rules of the game to incent healthy competition on dimensions that matter to the public interest. What we need is political innovation. And we propose changing the two major structural problems that are the largest contributors to the unhealthy competition. The first is party primaries, which we really talked about, but I'll give you a way to think about it. Think of the party primary as creating essentially a proverbial eye of the needle through which no problem-solving politician can pass. And that makes it hard to work constructively. And that's one of the key reasons we don't get results. And then the second thing is that we have no accountability for not getting results because, as we said before, we only have these two choices and there's no new competition, which is a segue into the second problem, plurality voting, something you may uh, never even have heard of or thought about. So back when our founders and framers were setting things up, there weren't great examples of how to really do the day-to-day -day business of a democracy. So they borrowed from Britain the way that we would vote. And essentially, the rule is you win an election if you have the most votes but you don't have to have, in America, a true majority. You don't have to have over 50%. So for example, in a three-way race, a candidate could win with 34% of the vote, meaning 66% split between the other two candidates. Now that means we didn't elect the candidate with a broad appeal to the majority of voters, but the real problem is it's an enormous barrier to new competition because it creates what we call the spoiler problem. Think back to 2016. For some here, you may recall not being able to vote for the candidate that appealed to you the most out of fear that it would inadvertently contribute to the election of the candidate you liked the least. For example, if you liked the Green Party candidate, Jill Stein, you weren't supposed to vote for her because that would take votes away from Hillary, spoil the election for her, and help elect Donald Trump. And on the other side, if you liked libertarian Gary Johnson, you still weren't supposed to vote for him because that would take votes away from Trump 
and spoil the election for him and help elect Hillary. But far more often, the spoiler problem keeps candidates from ever running in the first place. So go back to earlier this uh, year, or last year, in the spring, the former CEO of Starbucks, Howard Schultz, considered very publicly running as an independent, a centrist independent, in the presidential election. And the outcry from Democrats was loud and vicious because they believed that he wouldn't win but that he would take enough votes away from the eventual Democratic nominee that he would uh, turn the election over to Donald Trump. And that is precisely the kind of problem that plurality voting creates. If you think about it, politics is the only industry where we are regularly told that less competition is better for the consumer. And it doesn't matter if any of us think that Howard Schultz would have been the best president or not, we can all recognize that there's something unhealthy about a system where having more talented, successful, passionate people competing is somehow bad. So the net result of these party primaries and this plurality voting is unhealthy competition. As we said before, that means customers aren't well served. So to transform the system, we have to transform these two things. We do that with a package we call final five voting. Final five voting will break the partisan gridlock and incent results and accountability. With final five voting, we change two things. We're gonna change one in the primary and one in the general election. So first, as you might imagine, let's just get rid of broken party primaries. And instead, we'll turn to a top five primary. So what that would mean is you should go, up, go to the election. Every, you don't vote in the Democrat primary or the Republican primary. You vote on, in the, the primary, and everybody running is on the same ballot regardless of their affiliation, independents, Greens, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarian. And the top five finishers advance out of that primary to the general election. Then the second piece is we get rid of the broken plurality voting system and we replace it with ranked choice voting in the general election. And I'll explain how that works. So think of having these five candidates that came out of the primary and then essentially Think of being at a cocktail party or, or some other place where you're gathering before the election and you have this conversation that we all know how to have, which is, oh my gosh, I really want so-and-so to win. That's my, she, she's, or he is my favorite. And then, you know, okay, I guess I'd be okay with that one. And I won't move to Canada if it's number three. But boy, oh boy, if it's, you know, number five, that's an over my dead body candidate for me. And what we do with ranked choice voting is we get to express these feelings at the ballot box. And in, in the election, uh, in the voting location, this is what your ballot will look like. It's just a really simple grid and you put your preferences on in this way. So for me here, I chose Alexander Hamilton first, just because I love the musical and you can see it goes all the way to John Adams to be my last choice. Now, after everybody's expressed their preferences here, you can rank as many or as few as you want, the polls close, and then we count the first place votes alone. If one of these five candidates has a true majority over 50%, well, great, the election's over, that candidate wins. But if nobody has the support of the majority of voters, then the person who came in last is eliminated. And if you had selected the candidate who's now out of the race, your vote transfers to your next choice. Then we count again. And this process continues until one candidate reaches majority support. So it's basically a series of runoffs, but instead of having to keep coming back for a, a a new election, you cast all of your votes at once. Ranked choice voting ensures that we always elect the candidate with the broadest appeal to the most number of voters, but most importantly, it eliminates this single, uh, this great barrier to new competition. It eliminates the spoiler problem, which leads to healthy competition 
to solve problems and deliver results for the country. So final five voting, which is to say this combination of top five primaries and ranked choice voting in the general elections will powerfully alter the incentives. Let's reimagine Congress post elections, post these electoral innovations. So remember uh, when we had this bipartisan compromise landmark bill and the elected representative, you, could not vote yes. Well, now you have that exact same bill in front of you, and you can say to yourself, wow, under the old system, I never would have made it back through my primary if I voted for this. But under the new system, I'm pretty sure that I can be in the top five. And then, in the general election, with a combination of first and second place votes, I can craft a win. I can now vote yes if it's in the public interest. So let's revisit our initial Venn diagram. Remember, there's no connection today between acting the public interest and the likelihood of getting reelected, but when we implement final five voting and change our primaries in general, we create that intersection, which gives us healthy competition. This means that the actors in the politics industry are incented to do what we as a country need them to do. And that's the real power of political innovation. So what's next? We need to pass Final Five voting across the country. It happens in each state individually. And that's the macro need. But what can we do? Three things. Join the campaign in your state or found one if there isn't one. And these innovations are not just talk, campaigns are being created around the country. In fact, there's one in Florida to get rid of the party primary system and move to top two primaries. So it's not top five, but it, it uh, increases the size of the eye of the needle. And if you want to be involved in that, let me know on your cards and we can connect you. And then, if you want to found one in your state, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. We have an institute for political innovation that helps get these started. Of course, we need to fund. And everybody always asks me, well, what's it going to take? And I'd like to refer to something. I have a friend, David Crane, and he coined this term for political philanthropy, which he calls a special interest for the general interest. And I believe that political philanthropy offers the best ROI of any philanthropy out there today, in part because the dollars actually aren't as prohibitive as we might have thought. So let's scale it. Signers of the Bill and, Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Giving Pledge, the billionaires who have agreed to give away half of their wealth, collectively have pledged over $300 billion. And annually, all Americans give $400 billion every year to charitable causes. The cost to deliver final five voting per state is between $5 million for a small legislative state and 20 to $30 million for a large referendum state like California. So if I take an average of 15 million across 20 states, that's 300 million. $300 million is less than 5% of what was spent in the federal elections of 2016, and yet, 300 million for final five voting is far more likely to sustainably impact the trajectory of $4 trillion of government spending. So I'm on the board of the Unite America Fund where we're raising $100 million uh, to invest in these changes across the country. And if you are interested in becoming a political innovation philanthropist, you can just let me know, as you might imagine. Okay, the final thing is we have to evangelize. We have to let people know that it doesn't have to be this way. And the good news is that this is nonpartisan, so you can talk about it at all of your family gatherings. Uh, I'm personally at 100% success rate with all my airplane seatmates in the last year. <laughs> and if I can uh, like sort of be drawing a Venn diagram on the cocktail napkin before we take off, then I give myself an A. Additionally, I'm now trying to encourage them to order, pre-order my book while I'm still sitting there. I just look over their shoulder on the phone. So I'll encourage you all to also pre-order our book because it matters in evangelizing, which is we have to get critical mass of understanding that it doesn't have to be this way. 
Historically, the American political system was a critical foundation of the United States' success, and yet now it stands in the way of virtually every important issue we need to address. Yet we have every reason to be optimistic, perhaps even profoundly optimistic, because when you look at it this way, the reasons for our dysfunction are now so clear and rational, and the way forward is clear as well. This country was founded on the greatest political innovation of modern times, and political innovation is the key to our future. So I'd like to close with an invitation to action. Thomas Jefferson is said to have said, my HBS fact checker said he didn't really say it, but he's said to have said, we don't have government by the majority in America. We have government by the majority who participate. And historically, I thought that meant I needed to participate by voting, or perhaps really energetically supporting a candidate. But it turns out that it also means that we have to participate in the design of the rules of the game of our political system. Changing the rules of the game to incent healthy competition in politics opens whole new possibilities for our future, opens the possibility of results and accountability, and reclaiming the promise of our republic, this great American experiment, is the challenge of our times. And Michael and I hope that you will join us. Thank you so much. Thanks.